Let's talk about how to get b2 from this row of vectors. In fact, the operation to get b1 from this row of vectors is exactly the same as getting b2 from this row of vectors. Let's emphasize again. How do we get b2 from the input vector? Let's review what I said last week. What I want to emphasize is that b1 to b4 don't need to be generated sequentially. You don't need to finish b1 before generating b2, and then b3 and then b4. From b1 to b4, they are calculated simultaneously. How do we calculate b2? Let's take a look at a2. a2 will be multiplied by a matrix, then transform to q2. Then you will calculate the attention score from a1 to a4, according to the value of q2. How to calculate the attention score? Do the dot product of a2 and k1, and the dot product of q2 and k2, and the dot product of q2 and k3, and the dot product of q2 and k4. After getting these four scores, you may have to do a normalization, such as softmax. Then get the final attention score. We represent the attention score after normalization as alpha prime. After getting the attention scores, which are alpha 2, 1 alpha 2, 2 alpha 2, 3 alpha 2, 4. These four values. What do we with these four values? We multiply these values by v1, v2, v3, v4 respectively. We multiply alpha 2, 1, by v1. Multiply alpha 2, 2 by v2. Multiply alpha 2, 3 by v3. Multiply alpha 2, 4 by v4. Then sum up to be b2. We list the formula of b2 here. How is b2 calculated? b2 is calculated by multiply v by alpha, where v is v1 to v4. Each vector from v1 to v4 has a corresponding alpha. From alpha 2, 1 to alpha 2, 4. Multiply each v by alpha. Then sum them up to get b2. Here we demonstrate how is b2 calculated. You can multiply a3 by a transform to get q3. Then get b3. Multiply a4 from a transform to get q4. Then get b4. Now you know that. How to calculate b1 to b4 from a1 to a4. The process I just take about is the operation of self-attention. Next, we take a look at the operation. From the perspective of matrix multiplication, how does self-attention work? We know that from A1 to A4, each of them must generate QKV respectively. A1 has to generate Q1K1V1. A2 has to generate Q2K2V2. And so on. Each a generate QKV. What does it look like? If you want to use matrix operations to represent this operation, each of A. AI is multiplied by Q, or multiplied by a matrix, denoted as WQ, to get QI. Each A is multiplied by WQ, to get QI. You can combine these different A, and treat them as a matrix. What does that mean? Multiply A1 by WQ to get Q1. Multiply A2 by WQ to get Q2. Similarly, A3 and A4 are also multiplied by WQ to get Q3 and Q4. Then you can put A1 to A4 together, as a matrix, represented by I, the capital letter I, here, represent a matrix. The matrix has four columns, consist of A1 to A4. Then we denote the matrix I multiply by WQ, as Q. The Q is consists of Q1 to Q4. The four columns of Q, are the four vectors Q1 to Q4. So the process in which, we obtain q1 to q4, from a1 to a4, can be viewed as multiplying a matrix, whose columns are the inputs to the self-attention mechanism, a1 to a4, with another matrix wq. wq is actually a network parameter, that should be determined by the network itself. Multiply i by wq, we obtain q. The four columns of q, is simply q1 to q4. How about k and v? The process is actually the same, so we will skip the details. In case you feel bored, multiplying up by wk, we will get the vector k. So if we combine the four vectors, a1 to a4, into matrix i, 
Then after the multiplication with WK, we get another matrix K. The four columns of the matrix K are exactly K1 to K4. We can also calculate V in the same way. Since VI is I times WV, V can be calculated by I times WV. Again, the four columns of matrix V corresponds with V1 to V4. Summarizing all the above, we have three different matrices, WK, WQ and WV, in our model. By multiplying every vector A with those matrices, you can obtain Q, K, and V. Now, let's proceed to the next step. In the next step, we take the inner product of every Q and every K, respectively, to calculate the score of attention. Can we transform this step into matrix operations? Think of it from the perspective of matrix operations. Can you transform inner products into matrix operations? Alpha 1, 1, is the inner product of Q1 and K1. Now, let's lay the vector K1 down, making it look a bit fatter. Do you realize that? This is the same as doing the transpose operation? Hopefully, you do. So multiplying Q1 by the transpose of K1 is exactly the same as taking the inner product of them. In both operations, we end up with alpha 1, 1. Similarly, alpha 1, 2 is the inner product of Q1 and K2. Alpha 1, 3 is the inner product of Q1 and K3. Alpha 1, 4 is the inner product of Q1 and K4. These four steps can be combined into one operation. This is simply multiplying a matrix and a vector. In case you don't understand, I will elaborate. The four multiplications above are similar to what we've done before. We can put K1 to K4 together. That is, place them into a matrix as rows. Multiplying this with a vector will result in another vector. The values of the elements in the vector are the score of attention. Alpha 1, 1 to alpha 1, 4. Multiply Q1 with this matrix. You get alpha 1, 1 to alpha 1, 4. Okay, but I told you that. We aren't using only Q1 and K1 to K4. To calculate the attention score, we also need to consider Q2 with K1 to K4. To calculate the attention, how do you do that? Similarly, put Q2 here. Originally, only Q1 was multiplied by K1 to K4. We now multiply Q2 by K1 to K4. And end up with alpha 2, 1 to alpha 2, 4. Then, how about Q3? How about Q4? The calculations are exactly the same. You just multiply Q3 by K1 to K4. Calculate an attention score. Then you multiply Q4 by K1 to K4. And do the same thing. So, how exactly do we get these attention scores? You can think of it as the multiplication of two matrices. One matrix with its row. K. Which is K1 to K4 and the other matrix with its column, Q, which is Q1 to Q4. Take the matrix formed by K, and multiply it by the matrix formed by Q. We can get these attention scores. Since the matrix formed by K, consists of only one column, whose elements are K1 to K4, we use the transpose of matrix K, to match the dimension, when we're doing the multiplication. Multiply the transpose of K by Q, and we get a matrix called A. The attention scores between K and Q are stored in matrix A. Now, let's normalize the attention scores. For example, we can pass every column through a softmax function so that elements in the same column add up to 1. Like we mentioned before, softmax isn't the only option. Other functions, such as ReLU, are also viable and yield a similar result. Anyway, after we pass A, through the softmax function, the values change a bit. We use A prime to represent the result. After passing A through the softmax function. Okay, what's next? After we get A prime. What is the next step? Oh, there appears to be. A small error in my slide. Did you spot it? This should be A prime. Instead of A hat. It should be a prime symbol, not a hat symbol. Originally, I used the hat symbol. Later, when I changed it to the prime symbol. I forgot and left out this slide. Now, we multiply V, which is V1 to V4, by A to get B. 
Okay, this is the way. We get B. How exactly is B calculated? We can combine V1 to V4. And treat it as. The four columns of the V matrix. After getting matrix V. We multiply V by. The first column of A prime. To get B1. If you are familiar with linear algebra. You'll know that to multiply A prime by V. We can do matrix multiplication on V. And the first column of A prime. By doing matrix multiplication on V and the first column of A prime, we get the first column of the output matrix. This is the same as calculating the weighted sum of the V matrix and every element in a column from the A prime matrix. For example, we can get B1 from this column. Multiply V1 by the weight. Multiply V2 by the weight. Multiply V3 by the weight. Multiply V4 by the weight. We add all those up to get B1. From the perspective of matrix operation, what we're doing is simply multiplying the first column of A prime by V to get B1, and so on. I won't explain too much in detail, lest you might find it too redundant. Following the same logic, we multiply the second column of A prime by V to get B2. The third column of A prime is multiplied by V to get B3. The last column of A prime is multiplied by V to get B4. Okay, so we have multiplied the matrix A prime by the matrix V and got the matrix O. Every column in this O matrix is the output of self-attention. B1 to B4 to be exact. In summary, to do self-attention, we first calculate the matrices Q, K, and V. Then, we use Q to find the related positions. Lastly, we calculate the weighted sum of V. All in all, these operations all boil down to series of matrix multiplications. Why do I say this? Let's review the matrix multiplication we just saw. What is I? I is our input, which is the input of self-attention. The input of self-attention is a bunch of vectors or a row of vectors. This row of vectors is assigned as the column of the matrix. That is I. So, I is the input of self-attention. Then, this input is multiplied by three matrices. WQ, WK and WV. To get the three matrices, Q, K and V. Next, Q is multiplied by K transpose. Q, K and V are all calculated. You multiply Q by K transpose. To get the matrix A. You may do some processing for the matrix of A. To get A prime. Sometimes, we will call this A prime. Attention matrix. Then, you multiply A prime by V. To get O. O is the output of the self-attention layer. So, the input of self-attention is I. And the output of it is O. Then, you will realize that although it is called attention. With a very complicated operation here. In fact, inside the self-attention layer. The only parameters that need to be learned. Are WQ, WK and WV. Only WQ, WK and WV are unknown. We need to discover them through our training data. So, WQ, WK and WV are the unknown. They need to be found out. But, there is no unknown parameter in other operations. All are being set manually. There is no need to find them out through training data. Only WQ, WK and WV are found through training data. Okay. Above all are the operations of self-attention. Contents from I to O are about doing self-attention. There is an advanced version of self-attention, called multi-head self-attention. Multi-head self-attention, is widely used today. In homework 4, the original code 4 from TAs contains. Multi-head self-attention, the number of its head is set to 2. The TAs just gave you a hint to. Change the number of heads to 1. Then, you can pass it. But, it doesn't mean that all tasks, are suitable for using fewer heads. Some tasks. For example, translation and speech recognition are suitable for more heads to get better results. As for how many heads are needed, it is another hyperparameter which needs your fine tuning. So, why do we need more heads? You can think of it as all about the relevance. We say that when we are doing this self attention, we use Q to find related K. But, there are many different types of relevance, there are many different definitions. So, Maybe we can't have only one Q. We should have multiple Q. Different Q are responsible for. Different kinds of relevance. 
So, if you want to do multi-head self-attention, how would you do it? You might do it in this way. You first multiply A by a matrix to get Q. Next, you multiply Q by the other two matrices to get Q1 and Q2, respectively. Then, there are two superscripts. I represents the position. These 1 and 2 represent the order number of Q of this position. So, here are QI and 1 and QI and 2. It means that we have two heads. You can think that, in this issue, there are two different relevants. So we need to generate two different heads. To find the two different relevants, since there are two Q, there will be two K and two V as well. How can we get Q1 and Q2 from Q? How can we get K1 and K2 from K? How can we get V1 and V2 from V? In fact, we just let Q, K and V be multiplied by two matrices, two matrices and two matrices to get different ones, to get different heads. That's it. Okay, so, for another location, we do exactly the same thing. For another position A, after input, it will also get 2Q, 2K and 2V. Then how to do self-attention next? The operation is the same as the one we talked about before. But now, we do group 1 together firstly, and then do group 2 together. In other words, when Q1 is used to calculate the attention score, it doesn't care about K2. It doesn't care about K2. It just cares about K1. It just cares about K1. So, we use QI1 and KI1 to do attention. And use QI1 and KJ1 to do attention, too. That is, calculate the dot product to get the attention score. Also, when doing the weighted sum, we don't care about V2 anymore. Just look at VI1 and VJ1. So, multiply this attention score by VI1 and multiply this attention score by VJ1, then we get BI1. When getting BI1, only one of the heads is used. You will use another head to do the same thing. So Q2 only attends on K2. Q2 only attends on K2. When they are doing a weighted sum, only do a weighted sum on V2. Then you get BI2. Furthermore, if you have more heads, such as 8 heads or 16 heads, that will be the same operation. Here we use two heads as an example, showing you that how it works. When there are two heads, now we get BI1 and BI2. Then you might concatenate BI1 and BI2. And then it passes a transform, which is multiplied by a matrix. Finally, we get BI, and then send it to the next level. This is multi-head attention, a deformation of self-attention. So far, you may figure out that the self-attention layer misses one important piece of information. What is this information? This information is the location information. Think about it for a self-attention. For a self-attention layer, every input appears at the front of the sequence, or it appears at the back of the sequence. It doesn't have this information at all, right? You might say that didn't you just say, the inputs have position 1, 2, 3, 4? However, the 1, 2, 3, 4 is what we draw and mark on the slide. To help everyone understand, think about it for the self-attention layer. Is there any difference among position 1, position 2, position 3, and position 4? There is no difference at all, right? The operations of these four positions are the same. For self-attention, the distance between Q1 and Q4 isn't particularly far. The distance between 1 and 4 isn't far. And the distance between 2 and 3 is not close, too. It's like there is no distance in the world. The distance between all positions is the same. No one position is far away. And no position is close. No one is at the forefront of the whole sequence. And no one is at the end of the whole sequence. There may be some problems with this design. Because sometimes the location information may be important. For example, when we are doing pos tagging. That is, part of speech tagging. Maybe you know that verbs are less likely to appear at the beginning of sentences. So, if we know. A certain word is placed at the beginning of the sentence. The probability of it being a verb may be relatively low. The information about the location may often be useful. But so far, in the operation of self-attention, we have talked about. It has no location information at all. So, what to do? When you perform self-attention. If you think location information is an important thing. Then you can put the location information into it. 
How to do that? Here we need to use one technique. Called positional encoding. This technique is like this. You set a vector for each position. Called the positional vector. Here we use EI to represent it. The superscript I represents the position. Every different position corresponds to a different vector. That is, E1 is a vector. E2 is a vector. And E128 is still a vector. Different locations have their own E. Then we add this E to AI. It's all over. It equals telling yourself attention about the position information. If it sees AI seem to add EI, it will know the present position should be at position I. What does this EI look like? The earliest transformer in attention is all you need uses EI like this. In this picture, each column represents an E. The first position is E1. The second position is E2. The third position is E3. And so on. It puts this vector here to the first position. Add this vector to A at the second position. Add this vector to A at the third position. And so on. Each position has a unique E. By giving each position a different E, we hope that when your model deals with this input, it can know about the position information. What does the position information look like? The positional vector is handcrafted. That is, it is set by humans. The vector set by humans has many problems. Assume that when I determine this vector, I only set the length to 128. But what if the length of my current sequence is 129? But the earliest one in attention is all you need has no such a problem. Its vector is generated through a certain rule, a very magical function of sine and cosine. Of course, you will have new problems. Why are sine and cosine? Why not something else? Why must it be produced like this? Actually, you don't have to generate the handcrafted positional vector like this. The positional encoding is still a problem to be studied. You can create your own new method. Also, positional encoding can be learned from the data. About positional encoding, you can refer to the literature. This is a question to be studied. For example, I quote an article here. This is a paper on archive last year. So you can imagine these are actually very new papers. It compared and proposed new positional encoding. For example, the earliest positional encoding is generated by a magical sign function. If you treat the value in positional encoding as part of the network parameters and let your model learn it, it will look like this. This picture is viewed horizontally. It is viewed sideways. Each row represents a position. This is the original positional encoding generated with the sign function. This is learned by the model. There are magical methods in it. For example, this one was generated by RNN. The positional encoding is generated by RNN. The method proposed in this paper is called floater. It is generated by a magical network. In short, you have a lot of methods to generate positional encoding. Currently, we don't know which method is the best. This is a question that remains to be studied. So you don't have to worry about why sinusoidal is the best. You can always come up with new approaches. Okay, this self-attention is widely used. We have mentioned transformer many times. We all know that. There is a thing in the field of NLP called BERT. Self-attention is also used in BERT. The application of self-attention in NLP is familiar to everyone. But self-attention is not only for NLP-related applications. It can also be used for many other problems. For example, when dealing with speech, you can also use self-attention. But when dealing with speech, you may be concerned about using self-attention with some small changes. For example, because of the huge size of speech, if you want to express a sound signal as a row of vectors, the row of vectors may be very long. As we mentioned before, when doing speech recognition, you have to represent the sound signal as a row of vectors. And each vector only represents the length of 10 milliseconds. So, suppose we have a 1 second audio signal. It contains 100 vectors. For a 5 second audio signal, it contains 500 vectors. If you randomly say a word, it contains thousands of vectors. So, when you want to describe an audio signal, the length, as this sequence of vectors, is very considerable. What is the problem if we have considerable sequence and considerable length? Think about it. 
When we calculate this attention matrix, its complexity equals the square of its length. If you want to calculate the attention matrix A prime, you may need to do the inner product for L squared times. And if the value of L is very large, it will cost a lot of computational resources. If L is large, you also need a lot of memory to store this matrix. Suppose you are doing speech recognition, and if you say a word, the attention matrix produced by that sentence may be too large. It's too large to handle it easily, and also too hard to do the training. So what do we do? When processing audio signals, there is a trick called truncated self-attention. What truncated self-attention does is that we do not focus on the whole sentence, but only pay attention to a small range when we are doing self-attention. So how wide should this range be? That can be set by people. Then, why do we know? We may only need to concentrate on a small range. When doing speech recognition, that depends on your understanding of the problem. Maybe we only need to identify what kind of phoneme or what kind of content in this position. We don't need every sentence. We only need this sentence and its context within a certain range to do speech recognition. So if you are doing self-attention, maybe there is no need to read through every sentence. Maybe self-attention doesn't need to consider every sentence. You only need to consider a small range of sentences to speed up the calculation. Okay, that's all for truncated self-attention. Self-attention can also be applied to images. How can self-attention be applied to images? So far, when we are talking about self-attention, we say that this technique can be used when the input is a sequence of vectors or a vector set. It is suitable to use self-attention for those kinds of inputs. When we were talking about CNN, we told everyone that an image could be seen as a very long vector. But by changing our point of view, an image can also be seen as a vector set. How to see an image as a vector set? This is an image with a resolution of 5 times 10. We say this image can be seen as a tensor. The size of this tensor is 5 times 10 times 3. 3 represents the three channels of RGB. Then you can regard the pixel in each position as a three-dimensional vector. So every pixel is a three-dimensional vector. And the whole image is made up of 5 times 10 vectors. So we can change our point of view on this image. So. An image can be considered as a vector set. Since it can be considered as a vector set, you can also apply self-attention to it. Does anyone use self-attention to process an image? Yes. Here are two examples that you can refer to. So use self-attention on image processing is not a very new thing. Okay, then we can compare what kind of difference or relevance between self-attention and CNN. Suppose we apply self-attention to an image, and this is the pixel you want to consider. Then it generates query, and other pixels generate keys. This pixel generates query, and other pixels generate keys. When you are doing an inner product, what you have to consider is not a small area of the image, but the whole image's information. But, when using CNN, we mentioned that CNN would draw a receptive field last week. Each filter, every neural will, only consider the information in the scope of the receptive field. So if we compare CNN with self-attention, we can say that CNN can be seen as a simplified version of self-attention, because when doing CNN, we only consider the information in the receptive field. When doing self-attention, we are considering the information of the entire picture. So CNN is a simplified version of self-attention. Or the other way around. Self-attention is a complicated version of CNN. In CNN, we have to delineate the receptive field. Every neural only consider the information in the receptive field. And the scope and size of the receptive field are determined by people. I remember that we spent some time talking about the possible designs of receptive fields the week before last week. For self-attention, we use attention to find the relevant pixel. As if the receptive field is automatically learned. The network decides the shape of the receptive field. The network decides which pixels really need to be considered or related, centered on this pixel. So the scope of the receptive field is no longer manually delineated. 
Instead, let the machine learn it by itself. Here we mention the relationship between self-attention and CNN. You can read the paper called On the Relationship Between Self-Attention and Convolutional Layers. In this paper, the author proves rigorously in a mathematical way that CNN is a special case of self-attention. Self-attention can do exactly the same thing. By setting appropriate parameters, the function set of CNN looks like this. The function set of self-attention looks like this. So self-attention is a more flexible version of CNN, and CNN is a restricted version of self-attention. Self-attention will become CNN only through certain designs, certain restrictions. Then this is not a very old paper. It was uploaded on the internet on November 19th, so you know that the things we talked about today are actually very new information. Since CNN is a subset of self-attention, self-attention is more flexible. When we talked about overfitting, do you remember that a more flexible model needs more data? If you don't have enough data, it is possible to overfitting. As for small models and more limited models, they are suitable for preventing overfitting on small data. If you set this limit well, there will be good results. If you use different amounts of data to train CNN and self-attention, you can indeed see the phenomenon I just mentioned. The result of this experiment comes from Google's paper. An image is worth 16 times 16 words. This is Google's paper. It applies self-attention to the image. It divides an image into 16 by 16 patches. It views every patch as a word. Because generally, self-attention is more commonly used on NLP. So it imagined that every patch is actually a word. So the author uses a very fancy title. It's called a picture worth 16 by 16 words. What is this horizontal axis? The horizontal axis is the number of training images. Then you find out that, for Google, the so-called relatively small data is the amount of data you can't use. There are 10 million here, which is 10 million images, is a setting with a relatively small amount of data. Then what about the setting with a relatively large amount of data? There are 300 million pictures. In this experiment, after comparing the result of self-attention, which is represented by this light blue, to the result of CNN, which is represented by this dark gray line, you will find that, as the amount of data increases, the result of self-attention is getting better. Finally, when we maximize the amount of data, self-attention can surpass CNN. But when we use a small amount of data, CNN is better than self-attention, and will get a better result then what is the reason? You can explain it by the flexibility of CNN and self-attention. While self-attention is more flexible, more training data are needed. When training data are scarce, overfitting happens. While CNN is less flexible, when training data are scarce, you would get better results. But when the amount of training data increase, it cannot benefit from a larger amount of training data. This is the comparison between self-attention and CNN. Then you may want to know that. Self-attention and CNN. Which one is better? Which one should I choose? In fact, you can use both, right? In our homework 4, if you want to surpass the strong baseline, here is a hint. You can use the conformer. Both self-attention and CNN are used in it. Okay, let's compare. Self-attention with RNN. What is RNN? It is the recurrent neural network. However, in this course, we will not talk about recurrent neural network because most of the time RNN can be replaced by self-attention. So in this course, we won't talk about RNN detaily. But what is RNN? If you want to know, I will go through it quickly. RNN is the same as self-attention. They are being used to deal with the situation that the input is a sequence. This is how RNN works. This is your input sequence. You have a memory vector and also an RNN block. This RNN block will get the memory vector and the first input vector as input and will output another vector. Then according to the output, which we usually call it the hidden, according to the hidden, we further pass it through this fully connected network and make the prediction you want. What is the next step? When using the second one, the second vector of this sequence as input, you would make this vector, the second vector as input, 
it will also take the output vector of the previous time step as input for the next time step. After we pass them through the RNN block, a new vector will be generated. Pass it through the fully connected network and do anything you want. When the third vector comes in, you put the third vector and the output at the previous time step together and pass them through the RNN block. Generate new output. And then, at the fourth time step, when we input the fourth vector, bring the fourth vector and the output of the previous time step together. Pass them through the RNN block and get new output and pass the output through the fully connected network again. This is RNN. Recurrent neural network. You will find that RNN and self-attention are doing similar things. Their input is a vector sequence. The output of self-attention is another vector sequence. Each vector in it has already considered the entire input sequence and passed through the fully connected network for further processing. What about RNN? It will also output another vector sequence. This sequence of vectors will also pass through the fully connected network for further processing. So what is the difference between self-attention and RNN? Of course, a very obvious difference, you might say is, that every vector here, has considered the entire input sequence. While each vector in RNN, only considers the vectors that have already been input on the left. They do not consider the vectors on the right. This is a good observation. But RNN can actually be bidirectional. So if you use a bidirectional RNN, every hidden output here, the output of each memory, can also be regarded as considering the entire input sequence. But suppose we compare the output of RNN with the output of self-attention. Even if you use bidirectional RNN, there are still some differences. For RNN, if the yellow vector on the far right wants to consider the leftmost input, it must have the leftmost input stored in memory, and without forgetting it, take it all the way to the far right, in order to consider it at the end. But for self-attention, there is no such problem. It only needs to output a query here, and a key here, as long as they match. It doesn't matter how apart they are. You can easily extract information, from a vector that is very far away, from the entire sequence. So this is the difference, between RNN and self-attention. There is another major difference, when RNN is processing a row of input sequences to produce a row of output sequences. It cannot be parallelized. You have to generate this vector first, before you can generate this vector, then this vector, and so on. So in RNN, when input is a row of vector 2, output another row of vector, it can't handle it all at once. There is no way to process all outputs in parallel. But self-attention has an advantage. It can process all outputs in parallel. When you input a row of vectors, to output these four vectors, they are generated in parallel. You don't need to wait before you can calculate the others. In the output vector sequence, every vector is generated simultaneously. So in terms of computational efficiency, self-attention will be more efficient than RNN. You may found out that many applications are gradually modifying RNN architecture to the self-attention architecture. Okay, if you want to know more about the relationship between RNN and self-attention, you can read this article called Transformers or RNNs. It will tell you what to add to self-attention to turn it into RNN. And this is not a very old paper. This one was put on archive in June last year. So what I'm talking about today are some very new research results. Okay, so we won't go into the details on RNN in this course. If you are interested in RNN, these are videos of the previous course. The section on RNN, this time I won't talk about it, has an English version. Both the Chinese and English version of RNN are on YouTube. So finally, self-attention can also be used on graphs. Remember that at the beginning of the lecture, I told you that a graph could also be seen as a bunch of vectors. If it is a bunch of vectors, you can use self-attention to process it. So self-attention can also be used on graphs. But when we use self-attention on graphs, what's special? In a graph, we do not only have nodes that can be represented as vectors. We don't only have information on nodes, but also information on edges. We know which nodes are connected. 
That is, which nodes are related. We know which vectors are related. Before this, when we were doing self-attention, the so-called relevance is found by the network itself. But now that information is in the graph, with the information on edges, the relevance may not need to be found automatically by the machine. The edges on this graph have hinted us the correlation between nodes. Today, when you apply self-attention to a graph, you have a choice that when you are doing attention matrix calculation, you can count only the nodes connected by the edge. For example, in this picture, node 1 is connected to node 8. Then we only need to calculate the score of the attention between node 1 and node 8. Now 1 and 6 are connected. So we only need to calculate the score of attention between 1 and 6. 1 and 5 are connected. So we only need to calculate the score of attention between 1 and 5. 2 and 3 are connected. So we only need to calculate the score of attention between 2 and 3. And so on. If there is no connection between the two nodes, it is very likely to imply that there is no relationship between these two nodes. Since there's no relationship between them, we don't need to calculate its attention score. We just set it to zero. Because this graph is constructed based on humans with some domain knowledge. The domain knowledge told us that these two vectors are not related to each other. Then we don't need to use machines to learn this. In fact, when we apply self-attention with the restriction we talked about here on a graph, it is a kind of graph neural network, which is a kind of GNN. I know that GNN is also a very fancy topic. I won't say that self-attention includes all the varieties of GNN, but applying self-attention to a graph is a certain type of graph neural network. Here, we can't talk about it in detail. GNN is also very complicated. It has a lot of concepts. Here's the link to the teaching assistant's previous class. It took almost three hours talking about graph neural networks, and he hasn't finished it yet. This tells you that graph neural network also has a very deep technique. It's very complicated. It's not what we can finish in one class today. Okay, actually, this self-attention has a lot of varieties. You can read a paper called Long Range Arena. It compares various kinds of self-attention because the biggest problem of self-attention is that it's very computationally expensive. How to reduce the amount of calculation of self-attention is a future point. You can see here, we have various kinds of self-attention. The self-attention was first used on the transformer. So when many people talk about the transformer, it actually refers to this self-attention. Some people say that transformer in a broad sense refers to self-attention. So later, all kinds of self-attention do this. They're all called XXX former. For example, linformer, performer, reformer, etc. So the varieties of self-attention are now called XXX former. You can see that the horizontal axis represents the speed of its operation. There are many kinds of new XXX former that are faster than the original transformer, but the faster speed brings worse performance. This vertical axis represents performance. They tend to be worse than the original transformer. They have slightly worse performance but the speed will be faster. What kind of self-attention can be really fast and good? This is still an issue to be studied. If you are interested in self-attention and want to do further research, you can also take a look at this paper, Efficient Transformers, a survey. It will introduce various kinds of self-attention. This is not the thing we can teach in this course.